If I were to ask you to, in five short sentences, you know, five short sentences describe your relationship with your dad or your mom or your brother or sister or your best friend or your spouse or one of your kids, what would you say in those sentences or what would you write? Five sentences to reflect the past, the history of your relationship, and also the present. Now, probably there'd be some good and some bad, some joy and some struggle. It's kind of a good exercise that gives pretty clear insight into your relationships. Well, in this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, we're going to use that five sentences approach in a relationship someone had with Jesus that we read about in the New Testament, that someone was Mary, Mary of Bethany. And so over the course of the next hour, the Discover the Word group is going to trace five sentences through the Gospels that describe the progressive relationship Mary of Bethany discovered with Jesus. And at the same time, I think it will help us to reflect on how these five sentences might also describe our relationship with Jesus and the difference he can make in our lives. So five sentences on this edition of the Discover the Word podcast. Brian Hedinga, and welcome to the Discover the Word podcast, the group Bible study promoting Bible engagement from Our Daily Bread Ministries. And with this episode, we stand at the very front end of another year of studying the Bible together. We're pretty excited about what the Lord has in store for 2024. We have some great studies planned, and we have, Lord willing, some great guests who will join the group from time to time as well. And so it is our hope that spending time together this year will have an impact on how we read the scriptures and how we live our lives as followers of Christ. Bill Crowder, Elisa Morgan, Marty Hahn, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry are your regular study partners. And uh, at some point this year, we will also likely have another person joining the group as a regular as well. More on that uh, when the time comes. But in this first episode for 2024, it is Elisa and Bill and Daniel and Rasul who will be finding these five sentences scattered throughout the Gospels that help us understand the relationship between Jesus and Mary of Bethany. Now, Elisa will be leading this study called Five Sentences. You guys know what a red letter sentence is in the Bible, right? What is it? It represents what's supposed to be Jesus's words. I like the way you said that, Daniel. It represents what is supposed to be Jesus's words. And why did you couch it that way instead of just saying it's Jesus's words? Because the gospel writers were not all present with Jesus. And the ones that were are recounting it much later in life. And so I think it's important just to leave a little grace that maybe it's the idea that Jesus said, but isn't necessarily the exact wording. But that could get us in trouble because there's a lot of people that believe that's where the Holy Spirit was involved Mm -hmm. and that it is Jesus's exact words. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with both of those. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, I like Mm -hmm. to couch it that way just Mm -hmm. because I want to leave a little space that Mm -hmm. we're reading what somebody said Jesus said later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I kind of go the other way, Daniel not only because of the role of the Holy Spirit and inspiration, but also because the ancient Jewish culture was an oral culture, and primarily learning was by listening and memorizing and repeating. And especially one of the things, if you were a disciple of a rabbi, one of your responsibilities was to learn all your rabbi's teaching word for word Mm -hmm. so you could then present it to others. Mm -hmm. So I think in addition to the role of the Holy Spirit, I think there's some cultural things that can speak to the accuracy Mm -hmm. of the wording as well. There's somewhere in between either of those (laughs) um, perspectives. That sounds like a good place to land. uh, Mm -hmm. Where like when I think of the Gospel of John, there's just sometimes uh, some ambiguity about like where Jesus's words start and when yeah. John start, like in John three, yeah. right? And so I think it's a good approximation of Jesus's yeah. words. That's how I mm. approach it. And reliable and trustworthy. Absolutely. Right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna have a conversation about five sentences that we find in the New Testament, in, in the Gospels. And one of them is a red letter sentence in my Bible because they've got a red letter Bible, which is kind of fun. I love the red letter Bibles. It makes it very easy to find when you're looking for <laughs> Yeah, These Jesus are words said. that should have come from Jesus. Yeah. That's right. There are five sentences about one character in scripture. Mm. And I've been surprised to look at them as a conglomerate. I mean, I've, I've seen these sentences before. I've not necessarily paused on all of them, but 
I think when we look at them together, we're going to see a layering of relationship in this character that we can really relate to. And to separate them out, it's like you get a piece of the relationship. But as we thread them together and stack them on top of each other, you know, I think we're going to understand how this character knew Jesus in a really beautiful picture. But to surprise us, I want to start with the last sentence rather than the first sentence that we have about this character. The character is Mary of Bethany. And the sentence we'll start with, the red letter one, is a sentence that Jesus said about Mary. She did what she could. Let's read this context and you'll hear that sentence said, but we're going to get to know Mary in this last sentence as we begin to layer this relationship. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 14. And actually, I want us to read verses one through nine. If we could just go around and uh, maybe Russell, you start us, the Daniel, then Bill. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priest and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head, Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It should have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Hmm. And we're fulfilling that prophecy. (laughs) (laughs) This particular story reads like a crescendo to me. Mm. It's just this like symbols going off. Uh, Mary of Bethany anointing Jesus, you know, just a week before his crucifixion. It's just... It's so beautiful. It's so extravagant. It's so out there. And when we read it, I think I want to have that kind of love for Jesus Mm -hmm. myself. And I think it's important to look at this, but then we're going to unpack how did she get to this place through our other conversations. But let's start with who was Mary of Bethany? She was a sister of Lazarus and a sister of Martha. Great. And we know them from other stories. Yes. And it says in John 11 that Jesus loved Martha and Lazarus and her sister. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that throughout the Gospels, very few times does it say Jesus specifically loved an individual. Mm. This was one of those times. That's a great insight, Bill. And I think about the very famous picture of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet Mm -hmm. while Martha was hurriedly preparing and actually asked Jesus to rebuke her Mm -hmm. sister because Mm -hmm. she was so flustered Mm -hmm. and wanting help. And Jesus says, no, she's chosen Mm -hmm. the better portion and I won't be taken away from her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which means there's multiple stories where Mary is not looked at in the best of light at the beginning of the story. But then after Jesus interacts with her, whoever the person is that is looking down on Mary it brings new perspective and we see, oh, wow, Mary's doing these things that felt crazy at first, but Jesus said they're the right things. (laughs) Yeah, that's so good, Daniel. She's uh, countercultural here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because Mm -hmm. I guess Martha is the one that kind of confronts Jesus or, you know, and and others are the ones that criticize, but she doesn't speak up for herself. Mm -hmm. It makes what happens at Lazarus's funeral that much more poignant when she runs to Mm -hmm. Jesus and Mm -hmm. says, uh, you know, if you would have been here, Rabbi, my Mm -hmm. brother wouldn't have died. And we're going to go back and look at each one of these stories you're layering. But again, we're starting with the end in mind, if you will. Okay, so this is taking place just before the Passover, okay? And the religious leaders are worried that to arrest Jesus here is going to cause a big problem. Okay, then in verse 1 and 2, the setting is where? It's the home of who? Simon the leper. Well, who's he? We okay. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we assume, I think fairly safely, that he was, he a, was leper. a leper who had been <laughs> cleansed by Jesus and made whole, or else he wouldn't be able to host people 
Right. Uh, right. He wouldn't even have a home in the community. God. He'd be living out in the outskirts. Some have suggested he could be their father or mm-hmm. an adopted kind of elderly man that they brought in. We don't know, as yeah. you said. This story is told in three of the four Gospels. And John 12 specifically cites this as Mary of Bethany because her identity isn't revealed in the text we just read. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of interesting. There are other stories that are confusing and we think, well, is that her as well? What comes to your mind there? Yeah, the one, a woman comes in and anoints Jesus' feet and wipes with her tears and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. Luke 7. Mm -hmm. In Luke chapter 7. And that's in the home of Simon the Pharisee, not Simon the leper. Mm. So two Simons, two houses, (laughs) two women anointing Jesus in very passionate ways. Confusing. But as John says, he identifies this as Mary. Now, okay, was it common for a woman to interrupt a dinner where men are gathered What do we know about feet and cleansing? And what do we know about men and women? Well, in the Luke 7 story that was just mentioned, Jesus ends up rebuking his host, Simon the Pharisee, because when he came in, he did not receive a kiss. His feet were not washed. He was not anointed with oil. Which were all customary acts Which were all acts of hospitality Mm -hmm. on Mm -hmm. on a guest. He says, but this woman has done for me all the things that you did not do. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which some of these things could have been done, but they were usually done by a lower level servant in the household. Good. Yeah, and definitely not in a way that would interrupt the men. And this was, you know, a society in which the women weren't seen as being participants in that kind of fellowship gathering discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was countercultural for her Mm -hmm. to interrupt it. And washing feet with water, not super expensive perfume that could be sold for more than a year's wages. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oftentimes the only time a woman would be in a setting like this would be if she was serving the food. That's insightful. What do we know about Jesus and women? He had women disciples as well Mm -hmm. as men disciples. And and Mary was probably among them, as was Martha and others. She's rebuked. Yeah. In fact, this is in verse four. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume could have mm. been sold for more than a year's wages. John says it was Judas specifically. He right. does. Because he kept the purse. Yeah. Yeah. And at his notably his yeah. outrage was disingenuous yeah. because it was actually about pocketing it for himself. Right. Yeah. But the Torah commanded against waste. And so if he's going to be a religious zealot kind of person, it, he looks like he's doing the right mm-hmm. thing here. And Jesus' words towards her in verse 8. Daniel, would you read that again? She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. Okay, suddenly this is not just about treating him as a guest or honoring him, or cleansing him, suddenly this is about something more. What is it about? It's about what he's in Jerusalem for to begin with. He's there to go to the cross and to rise from the dead. And in between those two events, there's going to be a burial, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, even though we're not told that she understood all of these things, her actions are filling a gap that's going to be in the process because after the crucifixion, they don't have time to fully prepare the body for burial. And that happens a lot in the story with Jesus where someone does one thing or says one thing and they think it's about that thing. And then Jesus uses that to push it forward to like, Mm -hmm. and this was done because it was pointing to the fact that I would die or that I would rise again or whatever. But it's part of me with my sanctified imagination (laughs) that (laughs) imagines what if she understood what this was, right? Like, is there a a possibility that because of the effusiveness of the praise, right, truly wherever the gospel is preached throughout the Mm -hmm. world, what she's done will be told. And yes, it's possible that maybe she was sitting at his feet and listening and understood what was Mm -hmm. about to come. And she decided, let's do this gesture to recognize what's to come. And he's like, ah, you get it. Yeah, this was her Peter moment of, Mm -hmm. well, who do you say that I am? Right. Well, I say you're the Messiah, the son of God. Yeah. And here's Mary's opportunity to do the same thing. Like, No, I do get what's happening. Yeah, very, very possible. I love that sanctified imagination. I love that because it's really rooted in a true possibility. This is the last Mm -hmm. sentence that we have about Mary of Bethany, and it is a crescendo. 
kind of a sentence. She did what she could. She did a beautiful thing. I tell you, wherever the gospel's preached throughout the world, what she's done will be told in memory of her, almost as saying, she got it right. She understands who I am. She's connected to me. She's been following me. She's been listening to me. And now she's demonstrating that she understands what I'm about. And that's going to be told about her. Because honestly, a relationship with Jesus results in a response. You know, when we truly understand who he is, mm. we're changed and we want to say so and act differently. This is a red letter sentence happens to be. And we're going to look at what might be the other sentences that layer together that could have brought Mary to such an understanding. Yeah, five sentences. That is our study on this Discover the Word podcast with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Rasul Berry, and Daniel Ryan Day. Taking note of five simple sentences scattered throughout the Gospels that describe Mary of Bethany's journey in coming to know Jesus. And I think we'll see plenty of parallels that may describe our journey, too. Now, have you ever watched a TV show or a movie that begins with an event And then there's a scene change, and on the screen it informs you that you are now three years or three months or three weeks or three hours earlier. You just saw the result of the backstory that you are now going to be filled in on. Well, that's the kind of approach that the group is going to take with the next of these five sentences and the story of Jesus and Mary. So imagine flashing on the screen before you right now are the words, sometime earlier. We kind of started at the end with a sentence that described a more mature understanding of who Jesus was and what he came to do. And so how did Mary get there? Well, that's what the next sentence will begin to fill in for us, that backstory. And so as we go into this next of the five sentences, remember, on the screen it says, sometime earlier. So let's listen. Alisa? Think about some of the sentences in literature, movies, maybe stuff from your parents that have stuck with you. Just one sentence and have influenced you. You know, it just comes out in a given moment. In Gladiator, when Maximus says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. Whoa. Yeah, that was a good one. That's a great statement. It is good. That's good. When Tolkien wrote, not all who wonder are lost. Mm. For me, it would probably be the profound sentence. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it, though. I mean, talk about parents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, if you're playing around, you know, not doing the chores, the fact that they will be back mm-hmm. is an important thing. And, mm-hmm. of course, we have a Savior mm-hmm. who also will yeah. yeah. be yeah. back. I bring this up because we're spending some conversations looking at five sentences. And I think I want to propose a progression to these sentences as we look at them in Scripture. We started with the last sentence in our first conversation. And what was that sentence? She did what she could. She did what she could. And this sentence is said by Jesus of whom? Mary of Bethany. And we were struck by, I think we all talked about it. Did she understand in Mark 14, where she anointed Jesus' body with this very expensive nard in a room full of his disciples? Did she understand that she was really preparing his body for his Mm -hmm. burial. That's a radical expression of belief Mm -hmm. and faith. And all the stories we read up to that, it's, you know, Peter will go, oh, no, you can't possibly go to the cross. Or, you know, the disciples are like, no, you can't possibly do that. And here's Mary somehow at least acting as if that might be a reality. How did she get there? How did she did what she could become the cumulative sentence for her relationship? And so I want to go back to the first sentence that we have about Mary. And this is in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Listen for another sentence. This one is not said by Jesus that we know. It's not a red letter one. But let's see what we find out here. And let's just start off. uh, Bill, would you read 38 to 42? As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This sentence that I'm pulling out of this story is not exactly verbatim there, but we see it in 
She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So the takeaway sentence there is, she sat at his feet. Let's remind ourselves, this village was in Bethany. Um, John 11, 1 talks about that being about two miles from Jerusalem. It's in a house. Anybody know kind of what a New Testament typical house would be like? What's the setting? They're pretty small. And they have one primary living area and then one room that might be where they sleep or it's just one room Mm -hmm. um, sometimes Mm -hmm. and historically as someone would have a son who then got married they would add on to those houses sometimes and he would bring his wife into the home Mm -hmm. and so we don't know exactly what setup this is Mm -hmm. but it's usually pretty tight Mm -hmm. quarters and not real big and rarely multi-story or anything like that. Usually they had flat roofs Mm -hmm. and because it was so cramped inside, the roof would become kind of an outdoor living space where you could get away from the hustle and bustle of the little house downstairs. And the kitchen probably downstairs. I think another thing that might be relevant to this Mm -hmm. is, I mean, it's kind of basic, but there was no plumbing, you know, so that meant anything involving cooking, cleaning, dishwashing would involve a lot of mobility, a lot Mm -hmm. of going to get things, gather things like you had to organize things to get functions that we can kind of just take for granted. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal to prepare a meal for a guest like Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if Mary and Martha and Lazarus, their brother, we don't know if they've ever been married. We're not given those details. The relative or friend Simon is there. We Mm -hmm. don't see a whole lot of explanations for here. So Martha is preparing the food. In verse 39, she has a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, what do we know about that posture in that (laughs) culture and in that era? Yeah, it's the posture of a disciple. And so sitting at the feet of the rabbi and listening to what the rabbi's perspective on who God was, on the Torah, on the world, as a learner, as a disciple. And 99 times out of 100, it was men. (laughs) Yeah, unless you happen to be Jesus. Yeah, (laughs) right. It is the posture of a student, of a learner. She's not just merely kind of listening in while she's cooking. She is focused and intent to learn. Martha, scripture tells us, is distracted by, quote, many things, we're told. Verse 40, Martha's distracted by all the preparations, and she comes to Mm -hmm. Jesus, and she says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? I can understand that. Absolutely. The part that I always stub my toe on, and I'm a Martha advocate, Mm -hmm. so don't think I'm bashing Martha. The disciples do this, too, in a boat. They say, Lord, don't you care? Mm -hmm. I mean, that phrase just hits me really hard because the very fact that Jesus was present in a human body shows that he cared. Now, maybe they hadn't developed far enough in their understanding of him and who he was Mm -hmm. and why he came for them to really be able to grasp all that. But it seems to me that maybe the most inappropriate question Mm -hmm. you could ever ask Jesus is, don't you care? Mm. Yeah. I think where I see it though and get it is I have three young kids. So-and-so is fighting with so-and-so. They come up to me and they're like, dad, aren't you going to do anything about it? <laughs> right? Like, mm-hmm. and so in that sense, the don't you care, like, hey, you told so-and-so that they weren't allowed to watch TV, totally. and yet they're downstairs watching TV. I'm not tattling. I'm just letting you know, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And their whole reason for telling me is because they expect me to care in the sense of doing something about it. So I, I wonder if that's kind of what's maybe. And I think about two. what happens when God's action or inaction disappoints our expectations of what we believe God ought to do Mm -hmm. or should do. Yeah, because I think Martha wanted him to fix it. Right, yeah. You know, she was struggling. She was burdened. You know, maybe she would like to sit down and In a way that we even think it's consistent with his character, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, aren't you the one that caused us to love other people? Well, and there's nothing worse than doing house chores when somebody else is coming or when a Mm -hmm. guest is there and somebody else is not, like, helping and contributing and they're just... Yeah. Well, you are really removed from the relationship by having to do the chores. And so there is a piece there that's so legit. Now, how does Jesus respond? Verse 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. Well, I think, first of all, he says her name twice. He does. Mm. There's some weight there, Mm -hmm. right? But I don't think he said... I mean, you know, obviously we don't get tone of voice. Right. But if I understand anything about the heart of Jesus, I don't think he's shaking his head and going, 
Martha, Martha. You mm-hmm. know, I don't think it's that mm-hmm. kind of yeah. disgusted Absolutely, yeah. weariness with her. Thank I think you. it's mm-hmm. I think he's just really trying to grasp her attention. Especially the word choice. You are anxious and troubled about many things. That sounds empathetic to me. Yeah. Concerned. And then he goes on. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. So that could be, one thing could be a simple dish. Don't we like overdo hospitality at times when you just need a bowl Mm -hmm. of soup? Well, again, culturally, I don't know that we really understand how much weight there is on this because in ancient Israel, there are really only a couple of ways a woman could show her value. One was through bearing children, and the other was by being good at hospitality. Mm -hmm. And so, in a sense, her reputation's on the line because the most famous person in the nation has come to her house. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, too, is Jesus saying Mary has chosen what is better for her and giving Martha the space to do what Martha does, which is to show hospitality by creating an amazing meal, possibly, too. You know, but if we know Jesus, and I like how you talked about the heart of Jesus, Bill. You know, if you take the character, the mission, the stunning reality of Jesus and look at it here, he is really above your expectations. And Mm -hmm. the fact that you don't need to prove your worth by being hospitable or creating cultures, expectations as the way you're going to live. Instead, what defines your worth is your relationship to me. And understand that I'm overturning all Mm -hmm. of those expectations. Yes, I'm hungry. And yes, I want you to use your gifts. But please don't miss the opportunity that comes. All genders are included. All ages are included. All kinds of people Mm -hmm. are included to sit at my feet. So before she did what she could, Mary, like each one of us, is invited to sit at his feet. That is sentence number two of these five sentences that describe Mary of Bethany's developing relationship with Jesus. She sat at his feet. Pretty significant for Mary and pretty significant for us as well in our journey through life with Jesus. So in the next part of the conversation, they will discuss another defining moment in Mary's journey. When she hears Jesus is coming and instead of running out to meet him, she stays at home. Is that the complete opposite of what you would expect her to do? But is taking a step back always necessarily a bad thing? Well, sentence three of the five sentences after this. Well, with these conversations centering on Mary's journey with Jesus, it makes me want to take a moment and let you know about another of our Our Daily Bread Ministries platforms that aims to help women understand who Jesus is. Our God Hears Her platform is a collection of resources for women by women who desire to help fellow sisters in Christ feel His presence every day. It's a book, it's a blog, it's a podcast, and more. And you will hear Elisa's familiar voice on the God Hears Her podcast as she sits down with her fellow co-host, Aaron Adkins, and a variety of guests to have open and honest conversations about how even when life feels messy, God sees you, He hears you, and He loves you. In fact, let me give you a sneak peek into the newest season of the God Hears Her podcast. Listen to what's to come in season 10 of God Hears Her. We can't wait for season 10 of God Hears Her to come out. We explore so many exciting topics this season, like how to incorporate new spiritual practices in our lives, how to heal a marriage by overcoming jealousy and bitterness, and how to interpret the Bible as a gift from God. We also have a repeating guest this season to introduce a new film project from our Daily Bread Ministries. When we last had Julie Richardson on, she talked about her mother's moxie. Her passion to share moxie with the world has led to Julie's direction on the film project, Unshakable Moxie. Moxie means determination and courage. So when I look at somebody that's a woman of moxie, I think of somebody that's determined to follow Jesus with all their heart. We are so excited to chat with the people from Unshakable Moxie on this season of God Hears Her. Trust me, you do not want to miss what we have in store. We can't wait to be with you then. Yeah, listen to season 10 of God Hears Her on their website, godhearsher.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
and join in on their fun-loving, intentional, and encouraging conversations that remind us that you have always been seen, heard, and loved by God. Simply go to GodHearsHer.org and begin exploring all of the powerful resources, including the God Hears Her podcast with Elisa Morgan. And now, sentence number three. And again, this one is a little surprising that it's one of the five sentences in Mary's relationship with Jesus. She stayed at home. Let's listen. This might be an odd question, but stick with it for a second. Have you had a season in your life or even a moment in your life where you stepped back from Jesus. You just took a step back. Yeah, I can think about that, especially in college when I got into a relationship unequally yoked and Hmm. just like the distraction or the focus on being with this person was more valuable at the time. Mm -hmm. So I thought then continuing to focus on Jesus. Fortunately, that season didn't last too long, but Mm -hmm. I mean, it lasted longer than it should have. Mm-hmm. But uh, Yeah, thank you. And I think for me, I think of times when life has fallen apart in ways that have caused me to question God. Mm-hmm. And I think it, initially I thought that was stepping back. But I think over time mm-hmm. I've learned that actually that's stepping deeper into relationship mm-hmm. with God mm-hmm. by asking those questions and being willing to. But at the time it felt very much like, well, if you're like that, that I'm going to step back and... I was surprised to find that God was actually using some of those things, not necessarily causing them, but using them to draw me closer Mm. to him. We don't often talk about these moments. I mean, there are moments of, quote, disobedience, which you're kind of reflecting, Russell, in a way, but moments of great questioning or doubt or grief Mm. when we, we just punch pause. And I think as I look back at those in my life, too, grief, I remember losing one of our grandchildren. And I just laid on my bed and and I felt like I was taking a step back. But like you're saying, I found God was right there with me in it. I I mean, I didn't necessarily even want anybody around, but I could sense that. As we continue to look at the life of Mary of Bethany and sentences that scripture gives us about her, her actions, how she responded to Jesus, there's another layer that I want us to look at. So we started with the crescendo sentence, the last sentence of she did what she could in anointing Jesus' body before his burial, which is an amazing gesture of faith, perhaps, of, of almost a pronouncement, an evangelism kind of a sermon that, that she gave. And then in our last conversation, we looked at she sat at his feet and how radical mm-hmm. that was for a woman to sit and learn from a rabbi and how Jesus highlighted that posture And, you know, before we do what we could, we need to sit at Jesus' feet. This next sentence is another surprising one. She stayed at home. And this sentence is in the context of Lazarus' death Mm. in John chapter 11. So let's read the story. And we're not going to take every single sentence, but let's get the gist of it. Uh, Let's start in John 11 and maybe go verses 1 through 7, and then we'll skip down to the rest. Uh, Daniel, would you start us? Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Let's skip down to verse 17 to 20, Russell. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. The first thing I notice about this is what a contrast it is to our last conversation. (laughs) You know, Martha's running out to be with uh, Jesus and Mary's not. What hits you? Again, the setting is Bethany, about two miles Mm -hmm. east of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus in verse five, love Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, (laughs) he stayed where he was for two more days. You talk about an unexpected Mm -hmm. conjunction. Yeah, and I kind of get stuck even at the beginning of what you just read, Russell, 
So the Lord loved Martha Mm. and her sister and Lazarus. And I'm not saying that he loved her more or that he loved the others less. I'm just saying I'm struck by the word order there because it's not the word order we would choose. We would say the Lord loved Lazarus and Mary and, you know, what's her name in the kitchen? She's okay, too, you know, <laughs> that kind of deal. And this word phileos mm-hmm. is the kind of love that's expressed in that particular word, which is more than just friends. No, it's a brother love. Yeah. It's a family love. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's very, very close. So Lazarus is dead. And then in verse four on there, how does Jesus respond? He remains there. He knows in the end that Lazarus' death will reveal God's glory because mm-hmm. he's going to raise him from the dead. In verse 5, he switches to agapeo, which is a different kind of love, even a higher, more spiritual way, with the idea of you know really being in an eternal relationship with him. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Lazarus dies, mm-hmm. and the two sisters wept at home. Tradition would have them whispering his name over and over again. There were traditions of grief that Mm -hmm. were observed in culture. Jews would come, and we're told that, would come to the home. Many Jews, verse 19, had come. Professional mourners. Yeah, what was that about? We see this when Jairus' daughter dies, and the professional mourners are there, and they're wailing and crying out, and there's some sense that the more important a person was or the more beloved a person was, the more to do needed yeah. to be made about their death. Yeah. And if that feels weird to us, just think about all the services we have in our culture for end of life and mm-hmm. after death, right? Mm-hmm. We have a lot of people that are professionals at mm-hmm. guiding families through those difficult things too. I do think it's significant though. It mentions that they're less than two miles from Jerusalem. And I think that's important, not only because mm-hmm. of what the passage was that we skipped, which is that Jesus's life is threatened mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. going really close to the lion's den on Mm -hmm, this, mm -hmm. but also the fact that that's probably why there's more Jews coming Mm -hmm. because this was probably a small village, small town, but it's close and in proximity, a walking distance away from a really big city. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which more people have come. To grieve. Yeah. So what's striking though, is that when Jesus gets close, Martha runs out to greet him and Mary stays at home. And that's why, you know, I started Mm -hmm. with this question of, have you ever stepped back from Jesus? Mm -hmm. We don't exactly know why Mary stayed at home, but what goes through your mind? What could have been some of the reasons she stayed home? The actual meaning, though, here is she sat down. Hmm. That's the way it's phrased, at home. And what do we know about Jewish culture and about grief? There's a practice of sitting shiva, and it's a Hebrew word for seven, So after a burial of a close relative, the family gathered in the home of the deceased and with their outer garments visibly torn, and they received visitors for seven days. Hmm. If she was sitting Shiva, perhaps she thinks Jesus ought to come to her Mm -hmm. instead of her going to him. And then it's the respectful thing to do for Lazarus to sit Shiva and and to wait there. So that's a possibility which changes things. Now, of course, we haven't gone into the conversation that Martha and Jesus have. We will. But that helps us look at the Mary sat at home. There are other reasons she might have sat at home. And again, we don't know. It's conjecture. But you think about Mary seemed to be the quieter of the two Mm -hmm. in her personality, whereas Martha was action-oriented, and Martha would run out then to see Jesus. And we're also going to know that Martha was understanding who Jesus was in a very unique way in her conversation she would have with Jesus. Maybe Mary was just being introverted. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was her grief, her quiet, that led her to sit at home. And that goes back to some of our responses of, have you ever stepped back from Jesus? And what have you discovered in that moment? How do you respond to Mary sitting at home? Just that sentence, as we understand it in this context, and what does that do for you? Well, because I tend to side with Martha. (laughs) (laughs) I, I tend to make Martha the hero of the story, but I've had to learn over the years that that doesn't mean I have to make Mary the villain of the story. Exactly. It could be just as simple as, like you said, she's sitting Shiva and she's expecting Jesus to come to her. It could be that she's disappointed that Jesus, who did so many amazing things, wouldn't come and help. It reminds me of how the mere fact of how circumstances in life can diminish my enthusiastic, previously zealous 
desire to just worship or things that that in and of itself is a tragedy right like that's something mm-hmm. so disappointing or harmful could just change my initial visceral reaction is something that I, I can kind of think about like I don't need to know what was going on in her mind but I do know that just the mere change in her behavior is something that probably indicates some struggle going on with mm-hmm. her. And maybe it's just the narrator mm-hmm. pushing the story forward. Mm-hmm. Martha left, Mary stayed home, because mm-hmm. later Mary ends up not staying home. Mm-hmm. You're going to see a response of Mary in her, yeah. in her next conversation that's different. But I, I wanted to pause here on this sentence. You know, She sat at his feet. She learned. She stayed at home for mm-hmm. some reason, whether it was culture or whether it was grief. And then what will happen next as she builds to this climax of she did what she could. Yeah, I think it might be good for us just to sit with that sentence for a while. She stayed at home. Maybe there have been life circumstances that have led you to stay at home too. It may not feel like it, but you know, God is still in those moments, drawing us toward him. It doesn't always have to be a step back or a step away. Well, you are listening to the Discover the Word podcast with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Rasul Berry, and Daniel Ryan Day, and a study called Five Sentences. And next is sentence number four. Consider a time in your life when you sensed God was asking something of you. Could have been big, could have been small, maybe it was a nudge, maybe it was a conk over the head, you know, but you felt like he was reaching out to you and it, it required a response. High school, senior year, spring semester, and just sensing God leading me to take an opportunity to go to Romania for the summer hmm. and work with a mission group there. Hmm. And that was a pretty life-changing summer. I bet. I was pastoring a small church that we had planted in my hometown in West Virginia. And I was getting close to like 10 years after I'd graduated from Bible college. And I just felt this draw to go back to school and get more education. And so that meant I needed to find another church because I had to have a job so I could go to school. And so we ended up moving from West Virginia to Southern California, where I pastored a church while I went to Talbot School of Theology. Yeah, I think about the time when I was serving missions, and we um, had just bought a house in Orlando, and a few months later, we had been asked by our leadership to lead this summer music mission trip in Indiana. We were there for two weeks before we realized this is what God was calling us to next, to move from Florida to Indiana. And was like, I don't know what's going to happen with this house. I don't know what's going to happen with Mm -hmm. even if we're going to have all this team that we need in order to make this viable. But this is clearly what God is calling Mm -hmm. us to do. And ended up working it out. Yeah. Y'all have have all used examples that were really ministry oriented. I can just touch moments in my life where I know God was asking me to forgive my father. I did not want to. Or he was asking me to be patient in a situation Mm -hmm. or just to get up and go to church. <laughs> you know, it's just right, that there are yeah. just some moments like that to bring it down to it's sometimes an everyday, Elisa, this is where you need to be headed. Yeah. And that's that's a fourth sentence in our conversations about Mary of Bethany and the sentences she went to him. She went to him when he called. Mm-hmm. Uh, the context is again the situation of Lazarus' death and how it impacted Martha and Mary, sisters, to Lazarus and to each other. And there is a a progression. You know, we we looked at how Mary sat at Jesus' feet while Martha was working, and Jesus was so thrilled that she'd sat at his feet and was learning and focused. And then we looked in our last conversation about she stayed at home while Martha went out to meet Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we wondered, why did she stay at home when she was always at his feet? But she did, whether it was grief or practicing a cultural shiva or what. But in this conversation, we look at she went to him. So let's read John 11, verses 21 to 31, and look for that action again. Mm. Verse 21, Rasul, could you start us? Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how she quickly got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. You know, what were some of the reasons that we said that Mary may have stayed at home and Martha may have gone out. We talked about just the grief okay. that she may have felt. And Martha going out? Maybe a difference in personality. Maybe Mary's a little more introverted and Martha's just a little bit more action-oriented. And we also know about Martha that when we looked at her in the Luke 10 passage, you know, she was maybe still trying to figure out who Jesus was, but at least she was occupied with being mm-hmm. hospitable rather than learning. And there's probably been some movement in her mm. relationship. And we see this very dramatic statement that Martha says, Bill, tell us what you know about that in verse 28 on there. Yeah, well, first of all, it's interesting when Mary does come to Jesus, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the exact same thing Martha says, exactly. only Martha adds hope. Mm-hmm. Even now, even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. But Mary doesn't seem to have that extra layer there. Hers is just, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And it's almost like, and now it's too late. Martha's saying it's not too late. It's not too late. And this is a a pivotal moment. To me, Martha's revelation of who she says Jesus is, she says, I know my brother will rise on the resurrection day. He says, who am I? She says, I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. That's almost like what Mary does when she anoints Jesus, Mm. you know, before the disciples to prepare Mm -hmm. his body for his burial. These almost like equal, but very different personality wise statements of belief, aren't they? And Martha's statement is also like her Simon Peter Caesarea Philippi moment. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a powerful statement from her which I think that tells me that between Luke 10 and John 11, Martha has been taking time to sit at Jesus' feet and listen and learn because that's what takes her from, Lord, don't you care, to even now. I know that God will give you what you ask. I totally agree, Bill. You know, the the one thing that was required is sitting at his feet and learning. And she obviously Mm -hmm. learned. Yeah, and then she goes back to Mary and says, the teacher is waiting for you. And he would like to see you. I love that. That teacher, that rabbi, that the one that we sit at the feet of, he's Mm -hmm. calling you. In verse 29, there's three actions here. She heard this. She got up quickly and she went to him. Mm -hmm. And that word got up quickly and went to him, it really has the feeling of she ran to him. She rushed to Mm -hmm. him Mm -hmm. as quickly as she could. Which does seem to add context for her sitting and staying at home that even in the midst of her confusion or grief or whatever she's going through Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. her response is to move toward jesus not move away from him Mm -hmm. or even stay still Mm -hmm. and i think that that is worth acknowledging that she i mean she made a beeline Mm -hmm. she didn't hesitate Mm -hmm. i think there's something when i put myself in mary's robes if you will sitting shiva or simply grieving i really admire The process of grief, whether it was cultural or her personality, that she had invested herself in. She loved her brother. She loved Jesus. She loved her sister. And she's grieving. And then as the teacher comes, as her sister comes back and says, the teacher is calling for you. Okay, up up I go. And she runs to him. I think that's powerful. Mm -hmm. And I relate to that. And I'm also struck by, and you said this, Jesus stopped there. He stayed there. I wonder if he almost thought it'd be better to have a private conversation with Mm -hmm. Mary Mm -hmm. instead of going to the house where all of the mourners Mm. were. Of course, the mourners get up and go out with her. But you wonder if there was an honoring of maybe a dip in her emotions that Jesus would allow. We don't know, but it's interesting. Maybe it was something that needed to happen in her through the act of going and that Jesus was showing love and empathy and compassion to her by not coming directly to her, but inviting her to come out Mm. to him. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think of that as like cruel or not 
kind, but at the same time, it could be because something needed to happen within her Mm -hmm. by her getting up quickly and running to him. Mm -hmm. That is what set up the rest of the situation. Mm -hmm. One thing Mm -hmm. we know with certainty is that in the text, Jesus doesn't rebuke her for staying behind. Yeah. Why didn't you come with Martha? We could have had this conversation already. You know, there's no rebuke of her for whether she was withdrawing a little bit mm-hmm. from Jesus or whether she was just grieving and apparently without a whole lot of hope. Whatever it was, Jesus doesn't offer any rebuke. He welcomes her. Lisa, I'm curious about what do you think it looks like for us to get up quickly and go toward Jesus. It makes me flash back to the question we just asked each other. You know, when is the time that you sensed God asking you to do something? How do we respond? And I would hope that my response would be to get up quickly. Mm. But to be honest, I'm probably more apt to mull it over. (laughs) Yeah. I'm not sure I want to do that, God. Or what might happen if I do? Her immediate obedience is beautiful, isn't it? And again, let's layer these sentences and see what they mean. Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Mary stayed at home in a difficult moment. Mary went to Jesus when he called her, all before she did what she could. Sentence number four of these five sentences we're looking at that describe how Mary's relationship with Jesus progressed. She went to him. That's how she responded when Jesus called. She was listening. Uh, Mary's obedience to Jesus' call, uh, going to him when he called, was an important moment in their relationship. And so is that always our response as well? Important question to reflect on. Well, this study is called Five Sentences, as they walk us through Mary's journey getting to know Jesus and the difference it made for her. And we will identify sentence number five in just a moment, after we take a short break to look ahead to our next podcast. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, we begin a two-part study of two chapters found right in the middle of the Gospel of John. Now, a Bible study principle that we always try to stress is the importance of paying attention to the context. When we have questions about a particular text, almost always context can help. We like to say context is king. Well, Daniel was interested in what Jesus said about the good shepherd in John chapter 10. And so in preparing the study, he said he was amazed at how the context just kept exploding layers of understanding and meaning. Could somebody read John 10 verse 11 for us? I've got it. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Yeah, beautiful passage, one a lot of us know. And as I'm looking at all of these descriptions that Jesus is giving of himself as a good shepherd or the gate of the sheep or this whole sheep story thing, it was the first time I realized that when John 10 starts, Jesus is in the middle of a thought. And so Mm -hmm. it's like, wait a second. So what happens in nine? And then the further I rewound, I ended up like halfway through (laughs) chapter eight and realized that (laughs) all of this is like this momentum building in the story Mm -hmm. that gets to Jesus starting to talk about being a good shepherd. Yeah, it is an amazing demonstration of how context is king. And so be part of the Bible study next time on the Discover the Word podcast. And now let's pull our chairs up to the table with Elisa and Bill and Daniel and Rasul and look at this final sentence that will put another layer on the powerful and deep relationship between Jesus and Mary of Bethany and why she fell at his feet is one of those five sentences. You know, there are a lot of pictures in Scripture of people falling at Jesus' feet. Mm -hmm. Which ones do you think of? Who's the guy has a daughter. Jairus. Yeah, that guy. (laughs) That guy, that guy Jairus. (laughs) His daughter's sick and he comes to Jesus. I can't remember if he falls at Jesus' feet, but there's definitely desperation in the story. I think of Luke chapter five, when Peter had initially said, we've fished all night and caught nothing, but I'll let down the nets. And then when the nets come back up, he falls at Jesus' feet and Mm. says, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I think of something that's actually connected to the story you're talking about, Daniel, and that's the woman with the the bloody hemorrhage, Mm. that she actually fights her way through the crowd and 
tries to grab the hem of Jesus's mm-hmm. garment, which mm-hmm. by definition would be right there at his feet. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think about her. And the prodigal son, yeah. did he not return to his father that way? Yeah. I believe so. It's a graphic posture. What did it signify? I mean, I, today it signifies something. Can you imagine falling at somebody's feet? Mm. What would it mean to us? But what did it signify in that culture? In one sense, it signified humility. Mm-hmm. And in another sense, to use your word, Daniel, desperation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, when Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, falls at the feet of Jesus, the itinerant preacher, mm-hmm. there's a huge social construct that's being mm-hmm. torn apart there. And yet to him, he's desperate. He doesn't care about all that stuff. He cares about his daughter. Especially in an honor-shame mm-hmm. culture yeah. where you're shaming yourself or putting yourself in a position of shame. Yep. And so especially like in the story of the prodigal son, the mm-hmm. fact that the dad mm-hmm. clothes him with honor is a huge part of that story because he presents himself in humility and in a posture of shame. And the father responds by honoring him and so clothing great. him and having a feast for him. This is a one of the sentences that we've been stringing together to understand as best we can the narrative of the life of Mary of Bethany and how she connected to Jesus. We've got these little snapshots of actions that take her to Jesus, and and we're threading them together into kind of a a photo album here to see what her relationship was like. You know, the crescendo one is, is from Mark 14, and also in John 12, where she anoints Jesus before his death, preparing his body for his burial. And Jesus says of her, she's done a beautiful thing. She did what she could. How'd she get there? Well, we backed up. We met her sitting at Jesus' feet in Luke 10. That posture was significant because it was what? A posture of? Learner. Which was radical for a woman. And then we saw her next in this story we've been looking at, in the death of Lazarus and Jesus raising him from the dead. But after she sat at his feet, then we look at this sentence, she stayed at home. What was significant about that? When Lazarus had died and word arrives that Jesus is present after they had already reached out to Jesus to ask, you know, for his help to see Lazarus, their brother healed. Mm -hmm. So after he passes away, it's been a few days, Mm -hmm. word gets there that Jesus is around. Martha is the one, you know, that runs to him. And Mary, notably, it says, you know, stayed at home. Mm -hmm. And whether she's sitting Shiva, which is a a grief posture, or whether she's introverted, or whether she's just brokenhearted, she doesn't go. And that's a powerful thing. And then we looked at how she went to him when he called. Mm -hmm. And now we want to look at what she did when she arrived in his presence and this concept of falling at his feet. So let's read John 11, 32 to 44. We'll go around. Bill, if you'd start us. John 11, verse 32 When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Okay, I want to pause. There's several actions again in this sentence. What are they, Bill? She reached the place, Mm -hmm. she saw him, she fell at his feet, and then she made a statement. Okay. I was struck with where Jesus was and saw him. Mm -hmm. It seems like that would be almost a a given. Mm -hmm. Of course she saw him. Right. But the fact that... The narrator points out that she saw him. Just wonder if there's maybe a little more going on there. I love that. I mean, maybe she recognized him. Oh, yeah, this is my Jesus. You know, I've been I've been kind of struggling here. And she falls at his feet in Mm -hmm. this posture of yieldedness. And what did she say, Daniel? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So same thing that Martha said. Only Martha took it a step further with a statement of hope attached to it. And I don't think that necessarily has to mean that Mary was hopeless or faithless or anything like that. It may just be she was at a different place in her grief. But maybe if we look at that sentence and you see all those words, she reached the place, she saw him, she fell at his feet, and she said, I love what Mary trusted she could do with Jesus. Be that honest. Be that honest. Yeah. It's a statement of fact, but it also is a statement of regret that I wish you would have been here so that he wouldn't have died. You could have been here and he wouldn't have died. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you show up until now? Yeah. Now that it's too late. I'm so thrilled that we have this 
depiction mm-hmm. to invite ourselves into that we can be as Mary was with Jesus. Let's go on reading and see how did Jesus respond? Yeah. Russell verse 33 on. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take the stone away, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Mm. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus is deeply moved to the point of tears. And what's interesting, Elisa, is the language deeply moved in spirit and troubled Mm. is very similar to the language of Jesus's emotions in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's right. He was grieved and troubled in spirit. To the point of death. Yeah. Yeah. Deeply. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of emotion going on in this passage. And some of us come from traditions like myself where funerals can be very very intense. And, you know, especially when someone tragically, unexpectedly dies. And so I'm struck by Jesus's encounter with that grief and weeping, even knowing what he was going to eventually do. Mm -hmm. And it makes it very clear that the environment of the grief is almost this death represents this showdown with the concept Mm -hmm. of death itself, Mm -hmm. with the very problem that he's coming to collide with and confront Mm -hmm. and provide the sense of life. But in the meantime, it is a heavy, sad and grievous time. And then out of all of that, this unexpected miracle happens. Mm -hmm. The Gospels reveal Jesus' ultimate purpose, but they also show us real people who participated in the accomplishment of his purpose. And I think this story so wraps that so beautifully. It goes on in verses 45 to 46. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done, so much so that some Jews who came to grieve with the sisters believed, and some went to religious leaders to report him. Yep, and it's such a big deal that the religious leaders start having a conversation of, well, not only do we got to kill Jesus, but we got to kill Lazarus too, because too many people are believing as a result. Yeah. To take the person of Mary here and really experience the context of her faith journey. Mm -hmm. This is where her faith is really tried, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And like all of us, she goes through a crucible of of challenge. What will she do with Jesus? Uh, Remembering the order of these sentences is a powerful moment. She sat at his feet and learned. She stayed at home and grieved. She went to Jesus when he called her. She fell at his feet in recognition of his identity. And a result of understanding his identity She did what she could. Which one describes our current moment and response? And which one is God wooing us to embrace right now? Yeah, five sentences. And as we've looked at these snapshots of Mary's life, uh, we've realized that they weren't just small instances. They were defining moments in her life. These experiences with Jesus and choices she made because of them changed her. And that's true for each of us. We could all probably put together five sentences and what we did to move toward or away from Jesus. Well, this is Discover the Word with your study partners, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Rasul Berry, and Daniel Ryan Day. Grateful you could be part of this series as we journeyed with Mary through her five sentences. Now, these Bible studies we have on Discover the Word are only part of how we are telling the story of Jesus and helping people engage with the Scriptures here at Our Daily Bread Ministries. 
whether it's a free online class offered through Our Daily Bread University, the variety of Christian books that we publish, the classic Our Daily Bread devotional, or the many video and audio products we produce, God continues to transform hearts across the globe. And when you give a financial gift, your donation provides the fuel that's needed to help us do that. You can give on our website when you go to discovertheword.org and look for the Donate tab. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.